On the morning of May 12, 2017, computer screens around the world began displaying a ransom message. Your files have been encrypted. Pay $300 in Bitcoin within three days or lose everything forever. The message appeared in 28 languages. Most were machine translations, crude and awkward, but a few, Korean and possibly Chinese, read like they were written by native speakers. This detail would later become important. In hospitals across the United Kingdom, systems locked up mid-shift. The National Health Service was under attack. Ambulances were diverted, surgeries were canceled, emergency rooms turned patients away. Within minutes, the ransomware was spreading inside networks, jumping from one machine to the next. It didn't need a phishing email. It didn't need someone to click a link. It exploited a vulnerability in SMB v1, a file sharing protocol in Windows. The exploit was called Eternal Blue, leaked from the NSA's cyber arsenal just weeks earlier. The malware also installed Double Pulsar, another NSA backdoor to facilitate payload delivery. Once inside a system, WannaCry encrypted 176 different file types. Documents, photos, databases, everything. It also included a Tor client to communicate with hidden services, though the component wasn't fully functional. Within hours, the infection spread globally. FedEx in the United States, Telefonica in Spain, one of the first major European targets, Nissan's manufacturing plants, Deutsche Bahn's digital displays across Germany went dark. The Russian Ministry of Interior reported roughly 1,000 machines compromised, including railway systems. Chinese universities and petrol station payment kiosks locked up. Europol declared it an unprecedented attack. The United States activated its Cyber Unified Coordination Group. China deployed emergency response teams across universities and businesses. The ransomware used three Bitcoin wallets to collect payments, not one per victim. By the time it was over, the operators had collected approximately 52 BTC. Then they moved the funds through mixers, attempting to hide the trail. And then in a small coastal town in Devon, England, a 22-year-old security researcher noticed something unusual in the code. Marcus Hutchins grew up in Bracknell, near London, before his family moved to rural Devon when he was nine. As a teenager, he taught himself programming and spent time on online forums where young coders traded techniques and tested their skills. By his mid-teens, Marcus was writing malware, not to attack specific targets, but to understand how systems worked and to prove himself in these underground communities. Around 2012, when Marcus was 18, he released his first piece of malware called UPass Kit, designed to intercept login credentials from web browsers. It was a form grabber, simple but effective. He connected with someone online who went by Vinny. Together, they began selling malware on dark web forums, Marcus wrote the code, Vinny handled sales, splitting the profits. By 2014, their work had evolved. Marcus took ideas from older banking Trojans like Zeus, but coded something new from scratch. UPassKit became Kronos, a sophisticated banking Trojan with three key capabilities. A man in the browser component that intercepted data before it was encrypted, web injection support that could modify banking pages in real time, and form grabbing capability that captured everything a user typed. In June 2014, the first public advertisement for Kronos appeared on Alphabay, a dark web marketplace. It sold for approximately $7,000. Security researchers documented the sale at the time, tracking its spread. The FBI would later purchase samples in controlled operations to analyze it. Marcus was in comedy college, caught between his coursework and constant demands for updates to the software. By 2015, he wanted out, after graduating and dealing with personal struggles, Marcus stopped responding to Vinny's requests. The payments stopped. He decided to start over. He began writing an anonymous blog called Malware Tech, where he analyzed malware, reverse engineered threats, and explained how cyber criminals operated. His technical expertise caught the attention of security professionals worldwide. In 2016, Salim Nino, CEO of CryptosLogic, a cybersecurity firm in Los Angeles, offered Marcus a job. Working remotely from Ilfracombe, Devon, Marcus monitored botnets like Conficker and Neekers. Part of his routine involved registering suspicious domain names tied to malware to set up sinkholes, servers that captured traffic from infected machines. Crypto's Logic's internal monitoring system was called Cicada. Marcus had discovered multiple botnet behaviors before, but none received mainstream attention. 
It was routine work, something he did regularly. But on May 12, 2017, that routine would have global consequences. The ransomware spreading that day was called WannaCry. It was a worm, meaning it didn't require user interaction to spread. It exploited Eternal Blue, a Windows vulnerability that the NSA had weaponized for intelligence operations. But the NSA's arsenal had been compromised. In August 2016, a hacking group called the Shadow Brokers first appeared online. They claimed to have stolen cyber weapons from the NSA. For months, they leaked tools and exploits. Then, on April 14, 2017, they released a dump titled Lost in Translation. Inside were multiple NSA tools, including Eternal Blue and Double Pulsar. Microsoft had released a patch in March 2017, a month before the leak. Security Update MS17010. The advisory heavily emphasized disabling SMBV1, the vulnerable protocol, but millions of computers remained unpatched. Windows XP machines, Windows 7 systems, Windows Server 2003, enterprise networks that hadn't updated, they were all vulnerable. Microsoft took the rare step of releasing emergency patches for systems that were officially end of life. Windows XP, Windows Vista, and Windows Server 2003. The company created a war room during the attack, coordinating response efforts around the clock. Microsoft's Vice President Brad Smith issued a public statement in unusually strong terms, criticizing governments for stockpiling vulnerabilities instead of disclosing them to vendors. In the UK, the NHS was hit particularly hard. A 2018 UK Department of Health report would later reveal the scope of the failures. NHS Digital had warned trusts multiple times about cybersecurity hygiene, but none of the affected devices had been patched. Many machines were still running Windows XP, and some trusts had no idea how many outdated systems were even active on their networks. NHS Digital declared a critical incident shortly after the spread began. The National Audit Office documented that approximately 34 NHS trusts were directly infected. Radiology departments couldn't access imaging. Oncology systems went offline. Pathology networks were disrupted. Ambulances were diverted. MRI scanners were locked. Patient records became inaccessible. At least 19,000 appointments were canceled in the weeks following the attack, including urgent cancer referrals. The NHS estimated total costs from lost services and IT recovery at nearly 92 million pounds. Across the globe, financial losses reached billions of dollars, and WannaCry was still spreading. When Marcus woke up that morning and checked threat-sharing platforms, he saw scattered reports of ransomware. Nothing too unusual yet. He went out to lunch. While he was gone, WannaCry entered full swing. When Marcus returned home, his feed was filled with reports. Hospitals, banks, government agencies, businesses. The attack was global. Marcus immediately downloaded a sample of the ransomware and ran it in a controlled virtual environment. As the malware executed, he observed its behavior. Before encrypting files, WannaCry attempted to connect to a specific domain, a long, random string of characters. The domain wasn't registered. Following standard procedure, Marcus registered it for approximately $10.69 and configured servers to capture traffic. Then, something unexpected happened. A colleague messaged him. His sample of WannaCry had stopped working. Marcus ran the ransomware again. This time, it didn't encrypt anything. The malware checked if the domain was online. Since it was, the code stopped executing. Marcus had accidentally discovered a kill switch. The logic was sloppy. If the domain resolved, the malware exited. If it didn't, it continued. It appeared to be an anti-sandbox technique, designed to detect if the malware was running inside a researcher's virtual environment. But by registering the domain, Marcus had triggered the check across real infections worldwide. At peak, Marcus's sinkhole received over 20,000 connections per minute. Infected machines around the world were checking in. Within hours, the security community realized what had happened. A researcher discovered a second kill switch in an early variant, though it wasn't as widespread. But the attackers adapted quickly. Later versions removed the kill switch entirely. For the next several days, Marcus and his team worked to keep the sinkhole online. Attackers launched DDoS attacks using Mirai botnets to take it down. 
Eventually, Cloudflare offered to host the domain on their infrastructure to handle a massive traffic. Crypto's logic took over management once it was stabilized. Marcus posted a blog explaining what he'd found, careful not to claim more than what happened. But the media didn't see it that way. News outlets tracked down his identity. They called him a hero hacker who saved the world and reported that he purposely found and shut down the kill switch. None of it was accurate. Reporters appeared outside his home in Devon demanding interviews. Marcus received death threats and harassment online. Some people accused him of creating the ransomware himself. Others claimed he was working with intelligence agencies. The attention was overwhelming. After days of relentless requests, Marcus agreed to one interview with the Associated Press, hoping it would make everyone go away. The cybersecurity community recognized his role in mitigating the attack. DEF CON, the world's largest hacking conference, invited him to Las Vegas that August. His friends encouraged him to go, celebrate, take a break. Marcus went. For days he attended talks, met other researchers, and partied at hacker conferences. He had no idea that the FBI had been monitoring him for months. They knew about Kronos from the Alphabet takedown. A grand jury had already returned a sealed indictment on July 11, 2017. The FBI waited until he entered U.S. jurisdiction. On August 2, 2017, Marcus Hutchins was arrested at the Las Vegas airport. Federal agents approached Marcus as he prepared to board his flight back to the UK. He was placed in handcuffs. The charges related to Kronos, the banking trojan he'd created years earlier. The indictment included six counts, including conspiracy to commit computer fraud and advertising a wiretapping device. In the seized Alphabase servers, federal investigators had found conversations with Vinny, sales records from 2014, and code samples. The cybersecurity world was stunned. Just three months after WannaCry, the person who had helped stop it was now facing decades in prison. Bail was set at $30,000. Cybersecurity professionals rallied. Tara Wheeler, a security expert who had never met Marcus, posted bail. Marcus was released, but his passport was seized. He was prohibited from using the internet except for approved work. He couldn't leave the Central District of California. He lived with a contact in the security industry while awaiting trial. For two years, the case moved through federal court. In May 2019, Marcus entered guilty pleas to two counts related to the creation and distribution of Kronos and UPAS kit. Other charges were dismissed under the plea agreement. Prosecutors acknowledged in their sentencing memo that Marcus's behavior after 2015 had been lawful and noted his contributions to stopping WannaCry. Multiple cybersecurity experts submitted letters supporting Marcus, describing his work and character. On July 26, 2019, Marcus appeared before U.S. District Judge J.P. Statmuller in Milwaukee for sentencing. The judge noted Marcus's age when the offenses occurred and the rehabilitation that had taken place. Judge Statmuller emphasized Marcus's remarkable turnaround, calling it a major factor in his decision. The sentence? Time served and one year of supervised release. No additional prison time. Marcus posted a statement acknowledging his past actions and his focus on constructive security work. By December 2017, several governments had reached a conclusion. The United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, New Zealand. They formally attributed WannaCry to the Lazarus Group, a hacking organization linked to North Korea's Reconnaissance General Bureau. The evidence was substantial. Analysts found reuse of code from previous Lazarus malware families. Those ransom notes with Korean and Chinese translations that read like native speakers had written them became key indicators. The attack showed similarities to earlier operations, including the Sony Pictures hack in 2014. Infrastructure overlapped with bank heists in Bangladesh, Vietnam, and Poland. More than 200,000 computers had been infected across roughly 150 countries. FedEx, Telefonica, Nissan, Deutsche Bahn, Russian government systems, Chinese universities. The NHS faced nearly $92 million in losses and 19,000 canceled appointments. Globally, financial losses reached billions of dollars. But the kill switch had altered the worm's behavior. It prevented further encryption activity from samples that checked the domain. It could have been worse, much worse. Marcus remained in Los Angeles, continued working in cybersecurity, tracking state-aligned malware families 
exploit kits, and nation-state campaigns. He consulted with major security firms, though the clients weren't always publicly named. In June 2020, Wired magazine published a detailed feature about his story. His work expanded beyond traditional firms. Marcus started a TikTok account, posting short explainers about hacking, malware, and digital security. His videos gained millions of views, breaking down complex topics into digestible content. The WannaCry attack exposed critical weaknesses in global cybersecurity infrastructure. The incident became a turning point. Organizations accelerated patch deployment and implemented mandatory patch cycles. Governments began discussing active vulnerability disclosure policies. Should intelligence agencies disclose vulnerabilities to vendors or stockpile them for offensive operations? The story of WannaCry demonstrates the complexity of cybersecurity incidents. A single individual, following routine procedures, altered the trajectory of a global attack. That same individual faced prosecution for earlier conduct. The case illustrates how technical skill can be applied for both harmful and protective purposes, and how paths can change over time. Marcus Hutchins discovered the kill switch on May 12, 2017. Two years later, he resolved federal charges related to earlier malware development. Today, he continues work in cybersecurity, contributing to ongoing efforts to understand and mitigate digital threats. The internet he helped protect that day is still under constant attack. Ransomware has only grown more sophisticated. Nation states continue developing cyber weapons, and vulnerabilities are still being discovered, leaked, and exploited. But there are people working to defend against these threats. Researchers analyzing code, companies patching systems, governments coordinating responses. Marcus Hutchins is one of them. Not a hero, not a villain, just a person who made mistakes, learned from them, and chose to use his skills for something better. Let's hope that when the next major attack comes, and it will come, there are more people like him ready to step up.